quickly as I'd like them to. I, I read the promises in the Word of God and I think, oh wow, lots of great things could happen. And then I wait and wait and wait and lots of good things do happen, but maybe not as many things as I would like or as quickly as I'd like them to go. And sometimes I feel like something is missing. Um, I was going to talk about the fact that my girls like doing puzzles. If you come to our house at Christmas time, you'll see that they love doing puzzles. There's always puzzles everywhere. I hate puzzles. I can't stand them. It's a waste of time. You put them together and then you just tear them up and throw them back in the box. But instead of talking about that, I'm going to talk about the fact that we were out at uh, Dennis and Diane's on Thursday night and... And Diane and Evan were doing a puzzle together, and, and uh, I walked by and I said to Evan, uh, when you're done, you'll find the one piece I missed, I stole on you. And he's like, whoa, you can't steal a piece of the puzzle. So you got a thousand pieces, what's one piece that's missing, who cares? He was quite, he was, what's that? There is one missing. <laughs> it really wasn't me. It wasn't <laughs> But that's frustrating, right? You spend all that time and you get it all together and there's one piece missing. And, and it's almost complete, but it's not really complete. Sometimes I wonder that if God looks down on his people and he says, there's something just a little off here. There's just something missing. Something that it's almost complete. I've provided a lot of things, but there's one piece. One piece that is just not there consistently enough and, and he's looking for that peace that's what I want us to think about this morning and rather than tell you what that peace is I want to show it to you so grab your Bibles we're going to take a tour from the front of the Bible through to the back of the Bible I'm going to show you a pattern a pattern that God has had from the beginning where this peace is necessary for every other good thing he wants to have happen are you ready? Book of Numbers. Here's the first story we're going to talk about. Back about 1,500 years before Christ came to the earth, God's people had been slaves in Egypt. And they had been slaves in Egypt for about 430 years. And they did hard labor there, and they prayed and prayed and prayed for God to come and rescue them. And eventually God did hear their prayers and send a rescuer, a man by the name of Moses. Moses goes back to Egypt and he says that the Pharaoh has to let his people go. And so the Pharaoh refuses. You might have heard that there were ten plagues on Egypt. Those are the signs from God that he is serious about this. And finally the Pharaoh decides, okay, I'm going to let these slaves go. The slaves leave the Nile Delta and they cross the Red Sea. And they go out into the Sinai Peninsula and they get some instructions from God. And then they go up to a place where it says 12 spies there. A little place called Kadesh Barnea. A little town on the edge of the Promised Land. And you know this story well. We sing the little kid's song about it, right? The little kid's song says that 12 men went to spy out Canaan. God said... Pick 12 men and send them into the promised land and have them look around and have them come back and report and tell you what it's like. So those 12 men went up into the promised land and they all came back saying it's beautiful. It's the nicest place we've ever seen. It, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's got everything we would want. But 10 of them said it's beautiful but we can't take it. The people who live there are too big for us. The cities that are there are too fortified. We cannot take this land. There were only two men, Joshua and Caleb, who said that we can do this. We should go and do this. God will help us. But all the other ten said no. And the ten convinced the rest of God's people that they could not do what God had asked them to do. And so the scripture I want you to look at, Numbers chapter 14, verse 27 it says this, God, was, God has said this to Moses and Aaron, the leaders. He says, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites, so tell them this. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I've heard you say. In this desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who's grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the promised land. God says this, 
I'm asking you to go into this land, but you don't think you should. You don't want to go. You don't think I can help you win. So guess what? None of you are going in. Not one of you. Everyone 20 years of age or older is going to die before anyone else gets to try again. Because you didn't think you could do it. And so you're not going to do it. God says, you refuse to try, so I'm going to refuse to give it to you. Remember that lesson. Let's move forward for a second. Jump ahead a couple of books to the little book of Joshua. Joshua is about three books ahead here, or two. Uh, Joshua tells the story of after that generation of people all died out, God gives them another chance. God says, I've still got this land promised for you. I'm still waiting to give it to you. I still want you to go in and take this land. And so the new leader, Joshua, now has God's people at the edge of the Jordan River. The Jordan River forms the eastern boundary on the side of the land that God was giving his people. And if you look at the Jordan River these days, it's not that impressive. It's not much bigger than the Suris River anymore because they use it for irrigation and they, they pull a lot of water out of it. But when back in the old days, when it was at its flood stages and when it was really big, it was a good sized barrier and they weren't certain how they were going to get across the water. So God makes a promise to them. A promise that would show not only that they were going to be able to cross the river, but more importantly, that God was with them. It says in Joshua chapter 3, here's what he tells them to do, verse 14. He's told them that I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant. This is a box that has the Ten Commandments in it and other things. It's, it's a sign that God is with them. I want you to take that and step into the river. I want you to step into the river that's flowing past you and stopping you from going in, take the first step. Joshua 3, verse 14 says this. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of them. Now the Jordan was at its flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a great heap, in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. And while the water down to the rest of the sea has stopped as well. Oh, the part I want you to notice is it's at flood stage and it's running and it's the barrier. But as soon as they step in the water, it says immediately when the priest stepped in the water, that's when the water stopped flowing. That's when they got their pathway. That's when it became dry ground. That's when it changed, when they actually took the first step. Part I want you to notice is that God could have stopped that water at any point, but he doesn't do it until they take the step. Let's go ahead a little bit further. Jump ahead to my favorite story in the Old Testament. I think I could preach for 20 years from the story of David and Goliath. I, I think there's just so many lessons in the story of David and Goliath. First Samuel is just a few more books towards the middle of the Bible if you're looking for it. 1 Samuel 17, we know this story so well, we won't even really look it up, but you can read it later if you like. The story goes like this. The Philistines, which is God's people's enemy at the time, they come out and they're going to fight God's people. And, and instead of having everyone fight on a battlefield, they come up with an idea. We're going to choose our best warrior, and you guys choose your best warrior, and whoever defeats the other one, then the loser becomes the slave of the other people. That's their proposal. God's people agree to this and think, well, we've got some good warriors. Why not? And then they, the Philistines trot out this guy named Goliath. I've measured this before just to interest you. If, if Goliath were here on this stage, his head would be above the ruffle up on that, on that thing there. Like he's huge. And he comes out and says, okay, I'm ready to fight. Whoever can defeat me, come out and do it. And God's people tremble in fear. Nobody wants to fight Goliath. You know this story well. How many days did that go on? How many days did Goliath come out and challenge the people of God and the people of God just sit there and do nothing? How many days did that go on for? Anyone remember? 
Well, take a guess. Three, Come on. Three, ten, twelve. Pardon me? <laughs> three or ten or twelve. Three or ten or twelve? More than that? <laughs> More than thirty? Forty. Forty days. Woo. For forty days. More than a month. He came out and said, who will fight me? And nobody wanted to fight him. Until a young boy comes to visit his brothers, a young boy named David comes out with, from, with a message from his father to see how his brothers are doing. David hears the challenge. David hears what's going on, and David says, why isn't anybody fighting this guy? And so David says, well, I'll do it. And the king says, you can't do it. You're just a kid. He's probably 17 years old. I don't know. He's just young. And so... David, David says, I can still do it. God has saved me from the lion and the bear when I've been looking after my father's sheep. I, I'll be okay. God is with us. Who is this Philistine? There's, he can't do it. That big guy's got nothing if we've got God. And so David goes out with his sling and he meets Goliath and Goliath laughs at him and David hurls the stone and kills him. Here's the part I want you to think about though. David gives the credit to God, right? David says, God's with me. God will defeat Goliath. And everybody celebrates the fact that God did that. But here's the part I want you to think about. God could have given Goliath a heart attack on the second day. Right? Goliath could have come out on the second day and said, you bunch of chickens, nobody wants to fight me. He could have been dead right there, right? God could have killed him. But he waited for someone to stand up and say, I'll do it because God's with me. He waited for something. He waited for David. Move ahead a little bit further. Let's go to uh, the book of 2 Kings. So that's just a little further towards the middle of the Bible. 2 Kings, we're now at about the year 700 BC, 680 BC or so. And um, there's a king in Jerusalem in the middle of, of God's territory. The king of God's people is a guy... Uh, by the name of Hezekiah. Hezekiah is a pretty good king. He's not the best king they've ever had, but he's a pretty good king, but he's in trouble. Hezekiah is in big trouble because the Assyrian Empire is taking over the whole world. The Assyrians came from that northern area, and that squiggly line kind of shows you where their, their land was at the time. And they were coming to take over Judea. They were coming to take over God's people. And, and, and he's in big trouble. Hezekiah's in trouble. The people are scared. Things are going the wrong way. And then even worse, this happens. 2 Kings chapter 20. Let me flip over there because I will actually read this portion with you. Should have marked this, right? 2 Kings chapter 20 starts off this way. It says... In those days, Hezekiah became ill. So now he's not got only, he doesn't only have the problem of the political hassle that's going on and trying to feed all the people while they're being besieged and under war and all this. It says, now in those days, Hezekiah became ill and was ill to the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said, this is what the Lord says. So here comes the Lord's prophet, the one who speaks for God. He comes to the king and says, put your house in order. Because you're going to die. You will not recover. So that's Hezekiah's message. Everything's going the wrong way. You're now sick. You're not going to make it. God says you're done. Get your house in order. You will not recover. But it says in verse 2 that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. He said, Remember, O Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion, and I've done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He's not ready to go. He's not ready to go because he's still got work to do. He's not ready to go because the people are vulnerable. He's not ready to go. And so he begs the Lord. And he says, remember, Lord, I've been faithful. I've tried my hardest. I've been good. Don't, not now. I like verse 4. It says, before Isaiah had left the middle court, he hadn't even left the king's residence yet, the word of the Lord came back to him again and said, verse 5, go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David, says. I've heard your prayer, and I've seen your tears. 
and I will heal you. And he says, not only will I heal you, verse 6, I will add 15 years to your life. And he goes on for 15 more years. And I love the fact that God could have said, Hezekiah is sick, and he looks like he's going to die, but I'm going to give him 15 more years. He's going to recover and go on. But that's not exactly how it happens. He's sick, and he's about to die, and then he prays, and God says, I've heard your prayer, and I've seen your tears. And now I will do something. And he waited for the prayer. He waited for the ask. He waited to be acknowledged. He waited for Hezekiah to remember who was in charge. He waited until Hezekiah prayed. Then he blessed him. Then he healed him. Then he gave him 15 more years. Jump ahead a little bit further. We're going to go right to the New Testament now. Back to uh, the New Testament, Matthew chapter 28. This is the resurrection of Jesus. This is after the cross. This is after they've taken him down. This is after Saturday where they sat around doing nothing but mourning the fact that everything has fallen apart. And I love the fact that it says in Matthew chapter 28 that on the first day of the week, on Sunday morning, the ladies get up to go to the tomb to dress Jesus' body properly. They were so busy on Friday night because the Sabbath was coming and they couldn't work. They just quickly took Jesus down and they put him in the tomb. So now they're going back. Now they're going to go back and they're going to put the spices on him and embalm him, as we would call it. They're going to get him ready for his long-term burial. The ladies are going out there at the first of the morning. Sun's just come up and they're going to the garden. As they're going to the garden, they're talking about who's going to roll the stone away from the tomb because they can't do it. How are we even going to get in the place? We, well, we need some help. But what they find is they didn't need help at all because when they get to the garden, the stone is rolled away. And in fact, not only is the stone rolled away, but there's nothing in the tomb anymore. Jesus is gone. They assume that somebody has stolen the body. They assume that maybe the Romans have come and done that because Jesus was their enemy and maybe they wanted to get rid of the evidence and who knows what. Various said gospel writers talk about them speaking to an angel, but this is the bit I want you to notice, verse 8. It says, The women came away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him and, and, and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There you will see me. The part I like about that so much is that Jesus had already risen. He had already risen. Even before the ladies started on their way to the tomb. Even before the sun was up. Jesus was out of the tomb. And he could have shown up anywhere. He could, have, he could have just shown up in Peter's bedroom. He, he could have shown up in Mary's living room while she was eating breakfast. But what does he do? Jesus waits for someone to come to the tomb and see what's going on. Jesus waits for someone to come and investigate. And once someone shows up, he says, greetings. How are you? I'm alive. He waited for someone to show up. Let me give you one last one, and then we'll kind of put this together. Acts chapter 13 is where uh, we'll wrap things up. Acts chapter 13, the book of Acts is the story of the early church. And so in the early church, lots of things are going on. Lots of people are going out and teaching about Jesus and the resurrection and the new life and the hope and all the good things that are happening. One of the places where that's happening is in a town called Antioch. Antioch is one of the centers of Christianity at the time, big strong church that's really encouraging people and teaching and telling people the story. It says in, in, in Acts chapter 13 verse 1, it says this, that in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, and so it starts naming all of those. Look at verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have chosen for them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. That, that may not sound like very much, but I, I want you to notice just this one little fact. That they were worshipping God. 
And God says, you know what? The message that you guys have needs to spread further. It needs to be told to more people. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to choose those two people. And I want you to send them out with a message. And I want those two people to be my spokespersons, peoples. I don't know. I want them to go out and tell the story. And so Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, go off and they start on the first missionary journey to go around to all the places with the blessing of God to all these towns and tell the gospel story. And they're the first ones to go out and really tell the story from this point. Think about this. God could have spread the news in any way he wanted to, right? God could have put a billboard in the sky if he wanted to. He could have turned the sun purple if he wanted to. He could have done anything. How does God choose to get the message out? He says, send those two guys. Send these three people. Send those people over there. Let's work through Tabitha or Dorcas or whatever her name was at the time. Let's work through her for a while. Let's, let's let the people do something. And through the people, we will get our name out. We'll get the story out. We'll tell what's going on. I told you that at the start of this, I wanted to show you the piece that was missing. I wanted to not tell you what I think might be missing. I wanted to show you what God was looking for, each and every one of those cases. And I think I could give you 20 more if I just thought about it for five more minutes. You be the preachers. You tell me the answer. What was God waiting for in all of those situations, in every single one of them? What is he waiting for? For us to show up. He's waiting for us to show up. Exactly. He's waiting for us. In every single place, the one small necessary piece was that someone was willing to go. Someone was willing to act. The amazing story here, and the thing that would blow your mind if you didn't know the story of the gospel to start with, is that the God of the universe, the unhindered, all-powerful God of the universe, has chosen to work through you. He's chosen to work through us. He's chosen to get his message out when his people step up and say, I'll help, I'll go, I'll trust, I'll believe, I'll take this at its word. I won't just make this something I think about, I'll make this something I do. And that's when things happen. That's when things change. That's when the last puzzle piece falls into place. That's when you get a picture that is complete. And so here's my question for you today. And this is the, if you think of nothing else after you leave here, think about this question for a while. What is God asking you to do right now? What is God asking you to do? Now here's the thing. I don't think that's a hard question to answer. I think you already know. I think you've already known it for a long time. I think because you've read the word, you've seen something and said, I ought to be doing that. Or you've read the word and you've thought, I ought not to be doing this anymore. Or the Holy Spirit has worked on your conscience and there's something bugging you that you should be doing, but you just haven't done it yet. Someone you should call. Someone you should encourage. Someone you should help. Someone you should reach out to. Some place you ought to be. I don't think it's necessarily a huge thing. I think it's probably just a little bridge that you're supposed to build. Something small. And you just know you should do it. You just keep putting it off. You're a little scared. You're a little distracted. And God is just waiting, saying, would you step up? Would you do the thing you know you should do? Would you do that, that little thing? And then see what happens. Because your little effort might domino into something huge. In the book of James, uh, James chapter 4, verse 17 says that um, whoever knows the right thing or the good thing they should do and doesn't do it, to them that is sin. And sometimes we've used that verse sort of as a stick to beat people with and say, you know what you should be doing, and blah, blah, and we hit them with this and make people feel guilty and bad about not doing the good thing they should do. 
I don't think that verse is about that. I think that verse is just a truth. And the truth is simply this. The reason it is sinful not to do the good thing you should do is simply because you're refusing to submit to God. That's the problem. It's not the actual thing. It's the who's in charge part. You already know the good thing you should do. That's not the problem. I could go around right now and make you list it. You know them, don't you? You probably know a couple of things you should be doing that you haven't done quite yet. And the issue isn't really whether you do it or not. The issue is, is who's in charge of your life? Is it you? Or are you actually a follower of God who does what he asks you to do? That's the difference. And that one small thing can make all the difference. The other day when I was riding to work, I was on my motorcycle over by the Mohawk, by the corner of the Mohawk and the courthouse and the Estevan Motors there. And I was sitting on my motorcycle waiting for the lights to change. Any, anybody notice those cameras above the lights these days? They're not red light cameras, right? You know that. They're not trying to catch you for red lights. They're actually just activation cameras to make the light switch. When they, they, they videotape the intersection, and when you're waiting at a light, the computer figures it out and says, oh, you're waiting at the light and gives you a green light. Otherwise, the light just stays red. So I pulled up to the, to the light the other day, and I'm by the Mohawk there, I'm sitting on my motorcycle, and I'm waiting for the light to turn green. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and the lights are turning green everywhere else, but I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. Tom would tell me if I had a bigger motorcycle, the light would actually see me, right? If I had a Harley or something, it would see me sitting there, but it didn't see me. So you know what I had to do? Moved around in my lane a little bit. I was trying to get it to see me. You know what actually happened? I sat there until a car pulled in beside me. I had to wait for someone to show up. Someone else to show up. And once somebody else showed up, the camera went, oh, there's someone wanting a green light. And then we got the green light and away we went. I needed someone to show up or I'd still be sitting at the red light. And, and I wonder, and I might be wrong, you can tell me what you think, but I wonder if God's just waiting. I wonder if the light's red and he's just waiting, saying, could be green, things could be different, things could be better. I'm just waiting for someone to show up. <coughs> I, I like the idea that God has called us to be part of this. I, I like the idea that, that he works through us. And, and this isn't just an optional thing. This isn't just something for the people who are paid to work for the church. This is something all of us get to do. We get to participate. One of my favorite verses, and this is where we'll end. One of my favorite verses in terms of thinking about all of this is uh, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. that says, we are co-workers with God. We are God's fellow workers. We are his co-workers. Isn't that a beautiful thing to think about? That you are the co-worker of God. That he has chosen to limit himself and say, I'll work through you. Would you help me? And I think that's a beautiful opportunity. Because now we get to be part of something. We don't just get to sit and watch something. We get to help. We get to rejoice. We get to influence. We get to bring God to the situations we are in. Brothers and sisters, if you're feeling like something needs to change, if there's not something quite right yet, if there's something that needs, if God's promises haven't shown up yet, maybe we need to just take a step forward. Maybe we need to be the ones to make the difference. Maybe we need to be God's people in a way we haven't been yet. Can we be the one who says, here I am, send me. God is waiting for us to step up. I think that leads pretty easily into the remembrance of the cross this morning. Because again, one of my favorite things about the night that Jesus is betrayed and the night that he dies is that before all of that, he has to decide. 
Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus came to the earth to, um, to give his life for us. All of that is true. That's the gospel message. But the real part of it that we sometimes not, don't think enough about, I think, is that Jesus did pray, take this from me. This isn't what I want to do. If there's any other way, God, to save these people, please give me another way. I do not want to do this. I do not want to go through this pain. I do not want to go through this night. Jesus prayed that prayer so intently that it, one of the scripture writers said that his sweat was like blood dripping off of him. He was that wound up about it. Like, I don't want to do this. But then the most beautiful thing happened. What did he do? He said, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus said, I don't want to do this, but if you need me to do this, if this really is the plan, if this is the only way, if you need me to step up, then I'll step up. I'll be ready. Not my will, but yours. Let's go. Let's do that. And he did. And he sacrificed himself and gave the sacrifice and paid the price that we couldn't pay. Jesus says one decision to say, I won't do what I want, I will do what God wants, change the course of eternity for millions and millions and uncounted millions of people. In, in our own way, maybe we can change the course of eternity for some people. Maybe we can help out when we step up and say, not my will, but yours be done as well. May we think about that as well as the great sacrifice and our forgiven sins and everything else. Can we think about how we got there? We got there because Jesus said, I will do what you want. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son's death. But in the context that we've been talking today, thank you even more that he chose to do that. That he was willing, that he went forward even when it was difficult, even when it was scary, even when it was hard. He said, not my will, but yours be done. Father, help us to remember what that won for us and help us to think about what might be accomplished if we lived with the same attitude. Father, help this loaf not to just go into our body today, but help your spirit go into our body today. Help us to be like you as we think about your son's sacrifice and your son's need. Father, thank you for your son's blood that washes our sins away. Thank you that we can be considered pure and whole. Thank you that we can have your righteousness because you took our sinfulness. Thank you for that blessing. Help us to rejoice and celebrate in that right now in your son's name. who are watching on video thank you for joining us um, we look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon we'll say goodbye to those folks now